Good morning. We're, we're ready to begin the uh, second panel on military sequestration. I'm Richard Kaufman. I'm chairing the panel. Um, I'm also a member of the, one of the sponsoring organizations, the Economist for Peace and Security. Um, our, our, our approach to uh, the so-called fiscal cliff is um, quite different um, uh, uh, than um, the panel uh, you've just heard and much of the, um, if not almost all of the uh, discussion other than the military part of sequestration. Um, the fiscal cliff is considered by many with fear and loathing. Military sequestration, uh, however, um, is seen as a possible golden opportunity to get the military house in order or begin that process. It's argued by the Pentagon leaders that the military sequester would be crippling and would endanger national security. And of course, the um, aerospace industries argue that um, there will be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs lost if the uh, sequester uh, were enforced. There's another way to look at uh, the military sequester, um, which is what our panel uh, is um, um, organized to do. And especially if you conclude, as do some of us, as do I, that the Defense Department is excessively large, riddled with inefficiency, and subject to the corrupting influence of the defense industry. <clears throat> President Obama believes that it is time to end our wars and to do nation building at home. The sequester, feared by many, could be, however, a way of opening the door to nation building uh, of ourselves by shifting resources from defense to domestic needs. As we saw in the disasters of Katrina and Sandy, <clears throat> our in infrastructure needs alone are enormous. Whether um, uh, as a result of um, horrendous storms or not. To cite just a few, the cost of repairing and replacing our water systems, dams, levees, bridges, roads, and highways are estimated at $100 billion just to get them in order and not to uh, build new highway systems. Our aging water systems which annually discharge billions of gallons of untreated wastewater into U.S. surface waters would cost $390 billion to replace over a 20-year period. Construction of seawalls, which has now become a common source of discussion, in the New York Harbor would cost about $20 billion. Many more aspects of the military sequester will be discussed by our panel, and we will begin with uh, Carl Conetta, co-director of the Project on Defense Alternatives. Thank you, Richard. Um, Richard said that uh, some of us are looking at the uh, current situation uh, as a golden opportunity, I think it might be a way that uh, we can uh, parse the country politically is to the question of where exactly does that opportunity uh, sit. 
we might be looking at the military end of things and others are, are looking at uh, so-called uh, entitlements. Um, I, I want to, to begin by uh, setting a framework for thinking about a military policy in this period. Um, what I think it's most important for the country to recognize is that the principal strategic challenge that we face today is economic in nature, not military. That's what distinguishes this period from the years of the Second World War and the Cold War. Our principal task, from a strategic perspective, is to preserve and enhance the fundamentals of national strength for the long term. And that principally means the economy. And we need to do that in the context of a world economy that is rapidly evolving, increasingly competitive, and distinctly unstable. That, I think, is the framework idea, the national strategy that we need, or the, national, the perspective on national strategy that we need to understand what to do um, with our military. I want to uh, walk through some slides with you that will help frame everyone else's uh, discussion um, on the panel um, and uh, highlight what I think are some uh, essential insights uh, about our current situation with regard to, to uh, defense spending. Um, the first thing that it's important to recognize is that between 1999 and 2010, the Defense Department was uh, what I call a debt and deficit leader. It rose in its size faster than most other parts of the budget. It was uh, ahead of the general rise in discretionary spending, and it rose faster uh, than the average uh, rise in the overall federal budget. Now there are some subsections of that budget that rose faster, but if we are looking and asking ourselves, well, who were the debt and deficit leaders during this period when we moved from a balanced budget to a terribly unbalanced one, DOD is uh, among the culprits. That's evident on this chart. Uh, what you see on this chart is really a uh, a 60-year, or it's more than that, it's, uh, it is a 72-year history of defense spending. The period I'm talking about is uh, the first part of it starts right about here, and uh, this is the, the high point of spending, um, and it's during that period that we accumulated a great deal of the debt that, uh, that we're dealing with today. Now, I'm going to return to this uh, in a minute, but what I would like you to do today is to move to the other slide. It's there somewhere. This might be it right here. It's a it's just a freestanding GIF. Okay, we don't need it. We don't need it. The point, that's okay. Uh, the point I want to make is that regardless of what you hear, it's indisputable that since 2010, there's been very little reduction in defense spending, about 5% in, in real terms. So while the rest of us have been struggling hard with this question of debt and deficit reduction, uh, there's been very little of it uh, um, in the uh, Defense Department. It is true that there has been a significant reduction in war spending, and that will continue. Um, but you would expect as much. Likewise, you might expect that Social Security spending and uh, Medicare spending, uh, Medicaid spending, that all of these things would go down, and go down dramatically if people stopped dying and getting sick and getting old. But they're not, that's not happening. But with, the, with the, the reduction in the war and the withdrawals from the war, naturally, that part of the budget has gone down. What has not gone down uh, much at all, 5% in real terms, is what we could call the base Pentagon budget. Now, if we look at it from the 1999 perspective, it rose about 42% since then. Um, so there's been a dramatic rise, but very little reduction. Big question that sequestration poses with regard to defense, and you hear it again and again, is can we reduce defense spending by a trillion dollars over the next 10 years? I think the answer to that is yes, certainly we can. It implies rolling the budget back to 2006. Uh, so it's a 13% reduction in real terms. What that really requires us to do, and to do it easily, is to rethink 
how we produce military power, and how we use it in the world, what roles we want military power to fulfill. If there's an institutional problem with uh, sequestration, it's that it happens so quickly. What we can do if we are looking to make a deal is we can think about reducing defense spending 13% over three or four years, which will begin the process of releasing a trillion dollars into, uh, into the bargain that we are trying, uh, we are trying to set. A trillion dollars over 10 years is not that much. A 13% reduction over three or four years is well within the historical standard. Between 1989 and 1995, the defense budget reduced by 23%. So we're talking about accomplishing significantly less than that. Tomorrow, the project on defense alternatives, unfortunately, I don't have it today. Tomorrow, we'll be releasing a report that takes us step by step toward that reduction. How might it actually be accomplished? Um, a, couple of, um, a couple of hints um, are that I think it's important to reduce the size of the military further than the president has suggested, down to about 1.15 million. I think it's really important that we rethink and reform how we buy equipment and what types of equipment we buy. Um, how do we set standards? Because right now we are setting standards, we are establishing requirements, not by looking out in the world and asking ourselves, what is the challenge that we face in the world, in the military realm, but instead the principal leaders really are the defense industries. Um, and um, I think it was uh, David Walker, the former head of the, the Government Accountability Office, who said um, defense uh, requirements are being set not in terms of uh, the collective national defense requirement, but rather in terms of the individual service interest. So what we really need to do as part of a reform process is, uh, is rethink how we buy uh, military power, uh, and also um, um, uh, we also have to reform who exactly is, is leading that process. Is it a process that is industry-led, or is it, is it a process that's led uh, from the center with national security uh, goals in mind? Now I'm going to just walk through uh, the slides, and uh, I guess I just uh, fool around with this thing, huh? There we go. Another good uh, background piece of information is to compare our levels of military spending with military spending worldwide. What you see on the left of that slide in the purple is the United States, our allies, and uh, our NATO allies, and other allies that we have. Um, you'll notice the, and the, uh, the golden uh, or yellow uh, box there, bar, um, is the uh, aggregate of um, all of our potential challenger states including China and Russia. Uh, it is a four to one advantage that we presently enjoy. If we rolled back to the Cold War period, what you would see instead is the purple bar and the adversary bar were about equal. So what we've done is we've established over the past uh, 20 years, we've established a four to one advantage in spending over our principal um, and potential military competitors. When we hear that we can't reduce spending by 13%, what we're actually saying is that having a four to one advantage is not sufficient to allow a 13% rollback. This is the slide you saw initially. Um, and again, it, it illustrates uh, how uh, National Defense Budget Authority has changed um, over the past 60 years. Um, at the very end of that slide, you'll see this purple line. That, the difference between these two illustrates what sequestration would do to the military. It is true that there's something of a cliff there. There's a cliff anyway, and that's in part because uh, this chart does not take into account future war spending. We don't know what it is. Um, but when people talk about there being um, a catastrophe, a, uh, a, a, or a, a catastrophic effect, um, a disastrous impact of sequestration on defense. What they're actually saying is that we can't tolerate that degree of change. We can't tolerate that degree of change in our defense expenditure, which will bring us back to a level that is approximately the same as the level in 2006. Um, I think that uh, actually more is being said, and there's more to be heard when our national leaders say 
uh, a relatively modest reduction, a reduction that's about half of what we were able to accomplish uh, at the end of the Cold War will put the nation in risk. When they say that, given the fact that we have this earlier reality of a four to one advantage, what, they, what we should be hearing is this, that they are using the wrong strategy or that we have the wrong leaders. If this is not enough so that we cannot afford a 15%, a 13% reduction, then we either have the wrong strategy, the wrong leaders, or both. Um, I'll leave it at that and uh, pass it on to Bill. Right. Thank you very much, Thank Carl. You. Our next speaker is uh, Bill Hartung. Uh, Bill is the uh, director of the Arms and Security Initiative of the New America Foundation. Bill, you can sit there or? Uh, yeah, I'm going to sit here. Actually, my current affiliation is the Center for International Policy. I was at New America for a while, so that's uh, it's understandable that somebody might say that. If you Google me, that might turn up. Um, I have done a book on the military industrial complex, uh, History of the Lockheed Martin Corporation. So I've got uh, strong opinions about the uh, role of the military industrial complex in our politics and economics. Uh, but one of the things that I learned, a takeaway from writing the book, was that uh, as much money, as much power, uh, as much influence as it may have, the military-industrial complex doesn't always get what it wants. Uh, we saw, we've seen that in things like the uh, termination of the F-22 combat aircraft, uh, which was at least a modest victory for uh, sanity. Uh, and I think we'll see it going forward, given the fiscal constraints uh, on the budget, whether they're uh, needed or they're, or they're politically driven. Um, the real issues we have, I think, are uh, two. Uh, we need to reshape our military to meet the challenges that we currently face instead of chasing after Cold War threats or looking at f refunding the Iraq or Afghan wars, for example. Uh, and in doing so, I think we can certainly spend less than we're spending now. Uh, and we also need to rebuild our economy. Uh, and there may be differences of opinion about the best way to do that, but my own opinion is part of that has to do with public investment. And to the extent that we can shift money uh, towards uh, public investment, uh, I think we'll be uh, moving forward with the economy much more quickly than we are now. Um, now, you might have heard otherwise uh, if you were to listen to the Aerospace Industries Association and its allies in the Congress, who have spent a good part of the last year or more uh, telling us that uh, were we to make the modest cuts in Pentagon spending that Carl was talking about, uh, the sky is going to fall. Uh, not only in security terms, but in economic terms. Uh, and they have hooked that in part to a series of studies that they have uh, funded uh, that claim that we could lose up to a million jobs if the sequester went through, uh, Pentagon cuts at that level went through. Uh, now the first clue that I think you know, people might have looked at is the people who benefit from that policy are funding that study. Uh, now that should at least give you pause. It doesn't mean you shouldn't read the study but you should read it uh, with a grain of salt. Um, and essentially, you know, I, I see two major flaws in their approach. First of all, they assume that cutting the Pentagon budget is the only thing that is going to happen under sequester. Nothing else is going to happen. Nothing else is going to change. Uh, and that therefore, if you exempt Pentagon spending from cuts, uh, all will be well with the economy. Uh, but in fact, the sequester also deals with domestic programs. Uh, and if you were to exempt the Pentagon from the sequester and cut domestic programs further, uh, you would have an even deeper job crisis than you would have under sequester proper. And the reason for that is because uh, military spending is a particularly poor job creator. Uh, a tax cut would create 25% more jobs, infrastructure investment about one and a half times as many jobs, education perhaps two times as many jobs. So if you're going to cut uh, the job creating programs to keep the Pentagon, uh, you're going to lose more jobs than, than you preserve. And I think that's the main missing link in, in this sort of one-sided series of industry studies. Um, I think the other thing uh, that has come up is uh, more political in nature and was sort of driving some of the discussion, which was this notion that the sequester and the resulting Pentagon cuts were the fault of President Obama. Uh, and this was used during the campaign uh, to go around the country and uh, go to defense-dependent areas that also happen to be swing states 
and uh, use a scare campaign about job impacts of Pentagon cuts. Uh, but in fact, uh, people as uh, central to the campaign as Paul Ryan, for example, voted for the sequester. Uh, so to the extent that anybody's responsible for the impending uh, sequester should it happen, uh, both parties played a role in that. So the idea of pinning this possible policy change on President Obama was flawed in the first place. But in addition, uh, there were the same kind of exaggerations uh, in the state and regional claims about the impacts as there were uh, in terms of the claims about the overall effects on the national economy. And I think, you know, we, we can go into this more, but I, I think one reason is that um, Pentagon spending is more concentrated than the industry would have you believe. Uh, they're always talking about, well, if you don't build this plane, it's going to have impacts in 44 states, and therefore we can't possibly uh, get rid of it uh, either politically or economically. In fact, a lot of those states that they're talking about do very little. You know, if some guy's selling paper clips to the Pentagon, they would count that state as one of the 44 states. Uh, really, there's, a, there's a, some concentrated areas. Uh, there's places like, uh, you know, Fort Worth, uh, Dallas area. There's places like Southern California and uh, Seattle area and uh, where Boeing is, uh, and also in uh, Missouri, where they built some of their military aircraft. But it's a minority of the states in the country. And the notion that this uh, spreads all over the place is not uh, borne up by the few actual surveys that have been done. Uh, the Pentagon was forced to do some years ago a, a study on subcontracting. And they found that these uh, main areas where the prime contracts were also received many of the subcontracts. Uh, so I think there is more of a concentration of Pentagon spending than would be suggested. Uh, and then in the areas like Virginia, where uh, Senator McCain, uh, Senator Kelly Ayotte of New Hampshire, Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, uh, you know, took the scare tour and talked about shipbuilding, talked about military bases, uh, talked about defense consulting firms in Northern Virginia. Um, that argument didn't fly in the elections. Even though they tried to pin these potential effects on President Obama, he carried Virginia. And I think the reason for that is that the potential effects were not as deep as advertised. Uh, people didn't going to the voting booth saying, oh my goodness, we're gonna fall into the ocean uh, if this change in our budget goes forward. Um, part of it is because it's a lot smaller than uh, suggested. Uh, part of it is because the contractors are still doing quite well, uh, certainly better than we are. Um, uh, for example, a company like Lockheed Martin has uh, tens of billions of dollars in backlog uh, that they can work through. Uh, there's billions of dollars already in the pipeline in the government that they will receive. Uh, any cuts that occur uh, will phase in over time. They're not going to happen on January 2nd. Um, so for uh, these reasons, and the fact that the cuts are quite modest by historical standards, uh, these companies aren't going away. They may have to curb their profits a bit. Uh, they may have to rethink why they pay their executives $20 million a year, although I'm not holding my breath. Um, uh, but they're not going to disappear as uh, you know, economic entities uh, by any means. And, the industry has survived uh, past build-downs quite more significant. Uh, Defense-dependent communities have often recovered from those stronger than they went into them. Uh, so I think the regional claims of the arms lobby are also uh, vastly overstated. Um, you know, I, I guess um, the other issues that come up are, uh, you know, what about the broader economic impacts of Pentagon spending? Doesn't it give us great spin-offs? Uh, things like nuclear power, like the foundations of the internet, and so forth. Uh, well, that may have been the case uh, years ago, and even then, if you spent that amount of money in the domestic sector, you might well have gotten similar spin-offs. I mean, if you spend $80 billion a year on R&D, hopefully something will come out of it, uh, or somebody's doing something seriously, seriously wrong. Uh, but currently, it's really the domestic economy uh, and domestic industry uh, that is on the forefront of innovation. The Pentagon buys into the civilian innovation. It doesn't generate it. Um, so in that case as well, uh, I think we could accord, afford to cut back and we'd be doing fine. And of course, cutting back in this context means maybe instead of $80 billion a year in R&D money, the Pentagon gets $75 billion. Uh, so they, they're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, passing the tin cup around for uh, how to get money for R&D. Um, are we getting there? Oh, good. I was um, just trying to figure out what else to say. So, uh, 
I was more concise than I intended to be, um, which granted is very rare um, for me or any other speaker. Um, so uh, I guess my bottom line is um, economic strength is the foundation of our uh, military security. Without it, we, we can't sustain any kind of viable defense industry. Uh, and thankfully, as we'll probably discuss, uh, we're in a position where uh, the kinds of investments we're making are in the Pentagon sector are misplaced, aren't really meeting the threats we address, need to address, and therefore uh, we can reshape and uh, reduce the Pentagon budget uh, without suffering, in fact, probably uh, improving our security situation. So it's kind of a perfect storm of the need for fiscal discipline and the need to take a second look at uh, what the Pentagon spends its money on. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is Winslow Wheeler. Winslow is the director of the Military Reform Project and the, at the Center for Defense Information, um, both housed at um, the Project on Government Oversight. Good morning. Thanks for having me here. I'm going to talk about what I think are three fundamentals that we face for the future in the Pentagon budget. The first fundamental is that the Department of Defense is completely unprepared for its own future. Um, first of all, the Department of Defense thinks it, the future, is not going to happen. The extreme uh, right side of that chart that shows the sequester, um, compare that level of spending at, the, at its nadir to the historic norms uh, after Korea, after Vietnam, after the Reagan spend-up. Uh, that's where the historic norm is after we're finished these, the misadventure in Afghanistan. It's not going to likely happen as steeply uh, as sequester, but that's the historic norm. The Defense Department's core belief is that the blue line, the sequester line, isn't going to happen. It's going to be rescued from that. Uh, and it's going to be something somewhere is below the Obama budget, which is the, the flat red line, uh, but not as bad as sequester. Couldn't possibly happen. Be so, it would be a doomsday. Well, they need to check their own history. And given popular attitudes about our misadventures internationally, and given our budget situation, there's no other place but which that budget is, ha is headed. And uh, Carl's excessively generous 2006 budget level of spending will, you know, is, is a reasonable proposal for this point in time, uh, but that's a waypoint in what's happening, going to happen to Pentagon spending levels. Um, Point number two, even if I'm wrong about how deep uh, the new build down is going to go, we're certainly not going to see budget increases above current levels. We're going to see significant reductions. The Navy, for example, is planning on huge increases. Shipbuilding, for example, for 2012 was $12 billion. Uh, their new, the Navy's new 30-year plan calls for an annual average of 20 to $22 billion per year, depending on which CBO estimate you want to use. The Navy is going nowhere but south on shipbuilding budgets. And because of the Navy's proclivity for high-value uh, excuse me, high cost ships, uh, the ship count is going to take a nosedive. Um, during the presidential campaign, John Lehman accused uh, um, President Obama of having a plan to reduce the Navy to 250 ships. Well, Obama has no such plan. He's totally oblivious to these forces. Um, but they'll be lucky to end this process at 250 ships. The CBO estimate of what's possible to happen is somewhere between 270 ships on the north end and 170 ships on the south end. 
And that assumes um, that the current CBO cost estimates for the cost of these ships uh, is about right. And we know from past experience that CBO always has higher estimates from the Navy, but in reality, it's even CBO is a little bit low. Um, so the lower band of those CBO ship count numbers is extremely uh, possible given what's going to be happening to the Navy's shipbuilding budget as the Navy's shipbuilding budget experiences stresses like things like the F-35, if they're crazy enough to buy it, um, which will be much more expensive to acquire and operate than existing aircraft. Uh, and there's going to be a duel within the Navy budget between the F-35 and shipbuilding. Uh, they're both going to end up losing. Um, as this, this shrinkage occurs in the Navy fleet, it will, of course, also be aging. Um, ships will be built at a rate lesser than the rate at which the older ships are aging. The replacement rates can't match uh, previous decades. And so it's not a smaller, newer fleet. It's a smaller, older fleet. And if you think that smaller fleet is going to be a higher capability fleet, let's engage in that discussion because it ain't going to be. Um, third point, DOD's leadership is completely mentally uh, unprepared to face any of this stuff. Um, I couldn't help but do a, you know, a gobsmack, and thank God I didn't spew all my coffee on my computer screen this morning when I got up in Hagerstown and saw that somebody is floating Senator John Kerry's name as a candidate for Secretary of Defense. Um, I couldn't help but read that um, uh, above the fold article in the Washington Post as well, Lee Law, he didn't get the job for Secretary of, St of, of State, um, and somebody is trying to, you know, show him, throw him some kind of fob. Um, people like John Kerry are completely incapable of helping the Pentagon deal with this problem, even that problem, let alone the problem that I think is going to occur. Um, the other candidates, uh, uh, for the leadership of the Pentagon to uh, lead it through this era. Um, Michelle Flournoy is a very uh, smart uh, political wonk. Um, she has no background in any of these issues. Um, the other candidate is Ashton Carter. Um, he is perceived as a good manager. If you look at his job on the F-35, I simply cannot agree. Um, He's not taken on any of the fundamental problems that the F-35 represents. He's let it float on into the future, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to face a, fa a fate in this, even in the uh, sequester scenario, um, it's going to face a fate that's going to do nothing but increase the cost for an airplane that is a gigantic disappointment in terms of performance. Uh, and that is all his, the result of his management. I don't see him as a competent candidate to lead the Pentagon through this future it's about to face. Thank you very much. Thank you, Winslow. Our, our final speaker is uh, uh, Heather uh, Herbert. Um, she's a prolific author, uh, former speechwriter uh, in the Carter administration for the president, and this. Um, been very active in foreign affairs and national defense issues. Thank you, Richard. And I want to start by um, apologizing for being late, but saying since I'm talking about Congress and the future, it was merely a dramatization of the points I'm going to make in my, in my remarks. Um, and to, to um, contrast the th um, com with the comments that my three predecessors have made, I want to make three comments about, um, about political realities and what that is going to mean for how the dynamics they have um, pointed to and the, the facts that you see up on the screen will play out. Um, 
And so there are two of these arrows that point in one direction and a third arrow that points in a different direction. Uh, the first arrow being that, um, as this graph shows you, um, and as you know from your own work in other economic areas, the funds available for endless Pentagon spending, the funds available for a strategy that simply says, well, if we buy it, it will make us more secure, that era is over. And um, as, as the chart shows, and as Winslow, you implied, um, the Pentagon really had a good eight or nine year run where nobody said no on anything. And that um, many of us have, um, some of us may have worked in a culture like that, very few of us probably have. And um, that really changes an institutional culture in very problematic ways. And um, people around Washington who were out of the Pentagon for a number of years and then had the occasion to go back remarked upon how difficult it had become to say no and just how much this, um, this upslope that you see there uh, from 1999 to 2010 had really changed the culture internally. And I think much of what uh, Winslow just said um, reflects that underlying reality. Um, now second, um, there has in fact been a significant shift in foreign policy appetite, in national security appetite, both on the part of the two parties um, and on the part of the American public. And what do I mean when I say that? Um, there is no appetite for another land war in Asia, and there is no appetite for continuing the land war in Asia that we've still got in Afghanistan. And we just saw in the concluded presidential campaign that the candidate who was tempted and who had a wing of his party clearly pushing him to take the view that we should be in Afghanistan longer, that we should do more in Syria, that we should do something militarily in Iran, was continually pushed away from that um, by the more political politically minded wing of his party that was reading internal polling which said there's not much difference particularly on Afghanistan um, between Republicans and Democrats. So you don't, have, you don't have the demand side, if you will, for the kind of military spending that we've seen over the last decade. You no longer have um, a public outcry for military spending on this scale as a response to terrorism either. Um, the second point related to that, which is a bit of a two-edged sword, is that the public believes and elites also believe that there are cheaper technological solutions to our national security problems. Um, and of course, the most obvious um, exponent of this is drones and other remote control warfare that instead of invading a country, you can just, uh, the public perceives, and many elites also perceive, station drones along its border. Now, there's a whole fascinating strategic conversation about whether that's in fact correct and whether that policy is going to work out well over time. Um, there is also, as anyone who's ever worked in the field um, knows, the fact that technology is rather expensive. So, um, and then that that also justifies, as Bill Hartung mentioned, your, your need for an endless and endlessly growing R&D budget if your security is completely dependent on keeping your high tech offense ahead of the lower tech and cheaper defense that your adversaries will be able to mount against you. So um, technology is often put forward and believed by the public to be a budget panacea. In fact, it's not. Um, the third point, that should be made about appetite is that, um, and I would go further here than Bill Hartung did, and say we saw in this election um, at the presidential level and at the congressional level and across party lines an effort to make candidates pay for expressing willingness to cut Pentagon spending and really that had zero effects. Um, there was a massive infusion of, um, of corporate contributions and political effort which had pretty close to a zero return on investment. And if anyone can think of a counterexample, we can, we can talk about it in the Q&A. But um, Bill mentioned the presidential campaign. You also had a concerted effort in Virginia um, to take out a Senate candidate on the grounds that he would be harmful to the state's defense industry. That didn't work. Um, you had a concerted effort to target Elizabeth Warren on this. Um, also didn't work. Um, across party lines, there was an interesting case in uh, Western Michigan where you have a a libertarian Republican who actually had a veteran running against him as a Democrat, and he had no trouble getting reelected either. Uh, Ron and Rand Paul have not suffered electorally uh, in their communities and states for their heterodox stances on defense spending. So, um, as I say, really the the political ground, the will, um, the will to spend, has shifted has shifted pretty dramatically. 
Now, um, there is one lagging indicator, as we say, um, and that is what I'll call a political codependency between, on the one hand, our um, both parties, really, and the um, corporate um, military contractor interests, but even more than the actual realities of the role defense spending plays in our economy for reasons that Bill Hartung mentioned. There is the perception of the role that defense spending and defense and the military play in our economy, and the perception that um, cuts to or growth in the Pentagon spending is, is shorthand not just for how you, much you care about jobs, but how much you care about troops and how much you care about American security. And here, um, we'll start with the public because although, as I said, the public is very clear across party lines, doesn't want to have any more land wars, not really interested in big new, um, big new military adventures of any kind, feels confident that there are technological solutions that can address terrorism problems. At the same time, um, the public is also willing and interested to hear about waste and fraud related Pentagon cuts, but firmly believes that if you just go in and cut the Pentagon, what you're gonna do is hurt, civil hurt, um, hurt troops and hurt their families and hurt veterans. And um, it has to be said that um, the public's not entirely wrong in thinking this because what are the single biggest drivers? Um, troops, benefits, retirement, health care. So um, public is on to something here. But it is also interesting how in the public mind, um, the entire military establishment and the troops have become somewhat synonymous. Public will also say that they don't believe we need to spend more on Pentagon, which is a big change from four or five years ago, um, and it reflects, as I say, this change in view about how we keep our security, but not really comfortable with spending any less. That there is, in the public mind and also in the elite mind, this idea that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between what we spend and what we get. Um, and you know, this question of, do you, feel, do you feel safer today than you felt in 2007? Um, is a really interesting one in, in that regard, but it is, it is a reality underlying all of the political discourse in this area. Now, second, within the, within the military, Winslow started to touch on this, um, the pressure that's already being felt, there are winners and losers, and that is like a fabulous battle going on under a blanket that most of us don't see, but that will have effects on us. Um, the Army is the big loser here. Uh, the army is the big loser when you aren't do when you aren't having land wars for obvious reasons. Uh, the army is the big loser if you shift your interest from an area of the world, the Middle East, where much of what you're doing you're doing with by land. If you shift your emphasis from an adversary where it's at least hypothetically possible to imagine invading and occupying countries involved, to a theater, the Pacific, which is first and foremost about an ocean, and to a potential adversary, China, which nobody thinks you're going to invade and occupy with land forces. So then the question rises, what are we doing with this enormous army? Um, second loser is those equipment manufacturers and specialists who produce things that are useful for land combat and for high intensity warfare. So we saw this play out recently with the Abrams tank. Now, what was the Abrams tank originally designed to do? This is back to the point um, about long lead times. The Abrams tank was designed for the Cold War. You know, there's no place in the world that we're fighting set piece battles like were envisioned in Germany. So, you know, the, the Abrams tank, the military said, look, we have more of these than we're going to need in the future. Um, and that makes complete sense from a strategic point of view. From, from a, a military industrial base point of view, it's much more problematic. From a military industrial labor base point of view, it's much more problematic. And there are numerous other systems that we're going to see coming up in the future where this will play out. A third point to make is the, the fight between diversified and undiversified contractors. So, um, you know, they're smart. They saw this coming. There started to be massive um, consolidations and buyouts and layoffs in the contracting field two, three years ago. And um, some contractors, more to the point, have been busily expanding into the civilian side, into development assistance, into domestic, into homeland security. Uh, other contractors have not. And when you look at which contractors have been most aggressively pushing the panic button over sequester versus which CEOs have come out and made public pronouncements like, you know, this is an opportunity to be smart and the smart do fine in downturns, that's the underlying dynamic that we're looking at. And if you are a politician who happens to come from a state whose primary military contractors were not very smart, 
you have a problem. Whereas if you are a politician who happens to come from a state whose primary contractors are diversified that are now doing disease surveillance, for example, um, you can say, well, look, I can't help you on your Pentagon items, but I can help you with the CDC. So that is gonna be sort of a complicating piece of the political landscape. Similarly, um, folks with big army bases gonna have a problem. Folks with naval bases gonna do great. Folks on the West Coast, where it makes much more sense to base your assets that are looking toward the Pacific, gonna do well. Folks on the East Coast, a little more problematic. That lines up interestingly with some things that have happened around population shifts. Um, a couple of other things we should just mention, nuclear weapons, where, um, which we come back to this technological argument, and for those of you who remember our fights about nuclear weapons we've had in previous decades, this plays out again. On the one hand, nuclear weapons are of no use against terrorists. Um, they are of no use against any stateless force because it's very hard to deter someone who doesn't have a return address. Um, they are of, we have more, we have so many more than China. Um, so in that sense, they are, they're useless and expensive and we could get rid of them. But you also see, and you saw this as recently as um, Andrew Krupinovich's piece in, in Foreign Affairs that came out this week, um, well, relatively speaking, nuclear weapons are cheap, and in Pentagon world, this is actually true. So why don't we use nuclear weapons to assure deterrence, and then we don't have to station conventional forces in Korea, say. Uh, or we can reduce the number of conventional forces we station in Korea. So you then see, again, this interesting trade-off of what is cheap. Um, and when, in, when you are discussing budgetary questions in the absence of strategy, and in the absence of, of a really hard strategic relook at some of these things, we are going to get into this discussion of there's cheap in the short term and then there's cheap in the long term, which will play out in some of the ways that my panel colleagues have mentioned. Um, I'll just make one last slightly provocative point to start a fight among the panel members. And um, just for fun, I'll disagree with Winslow. So having said all of this, what do we want for Pentagon leadership? What should we want to, um, to make sure that we are actually managing, you know, managing the reality behind these numbers in a politically smart and a security smart way. And it's frankly not clear to me that it is a bad idea to have someone who isn't deeply steeped in Pentagon management practices. And that actually having someone who does come from outside or who hasn't spent his or her whole career working his or her way up doing Pentagon management, but has you know, perhaps the single most important ability in whoever the next Secretary of Defense is, the ability to say, why do we do it that way? And that, that, that the person who's been willing to, to challenge that way repeatedly would be, would be my lead candidate for Secretary of Defense. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Winslow, would, would you like to respond to uh, Heather's Sure. Um, a perfectly reasonable challenge. Um, for Pentagon leadership, uh, sec let's call it Secretary of Defense, first of all, you don't need a Secretary of State. Um, you don't need a competitor to Susan Rice um, to uh, idly think over notions of what we should do here or there. Uh, you don't want a second, second Secretary of State. Second, uh, you want somebody with demonstrated, with emphasis on the word demonstrated competence in a build down. Uh, somebody, perhaps from business, um, uh, who has done it rather than has talked about it. Um, there are candidates out there. I don't know what their names are, but there's people who've done it. Uh, that kind of person needs to be found. Third, uh, Pentagon experience is nice if you've demonstrated mastery of bureaucracy there. Ashton Carter has not. Um, you, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's an, uh, there's two dueling qualifications here. Can you find somebody from the private sector uh, who's done build downs and knows the kind of, of intellectual and moral toughness you have to engage in to kick over that many rice bowls? Or can you find somebody 
inside the Pentagon bureaucracy who's shown some real um, mental and again moral ability to uh, face down the Joint Chiefs when they come pounding the table for you know, CVN 79 and CVN 80 um, and that kind of foolishness. Um, uh, there's, there's people out there, I know their names, I'm not gonna condemn them forevermore by Winslow Wheeler mentioning their name. Um, but let's get serious about this. If you want some policy want blivet, this city is full of them. John Kerry will be fine. Carl would like to respond. Just put in two cents as well. You know, I think that um, the principal problem we face is not who leads DOD. I think that there is a special challenge there, and the special challenge is evident if you think about how much of our government is, in fact, DOD. This is the largest, by far, sector of our government, and it's a special sector in this sense, that it's, it's, it's a feudalistic kingdom. Uh, it's broken up into, into, uh, into uh, various parts that uh, contend with each other. Those parts, uh, Navy, Air Force, uh, Army, Marine Corps, uh, in de they themselves break down into various parts. Then you have this close intersection with uh, industry that adds another element. Managing that and actually getting on top of that, gaining control of it and directing it in a direction that reflects national policy and not the interests of the various parts, that's a difficult, difficult job. I don't know that Senator Kerry is, is particularly well suited for it. I, I really don't have an opinion on that, but I think it's important that we appreciate how difficult that job is. A bigger challenge, I think, is to produce national leadership outside of DOD that will actually take charge of our national security discourse, our national security strategy, and think not first through the lens of the Defense Department and through the lens of the individual services, which now play an enormous part in deciding our strategy. I don't think they should. I think that, that that strategy should be set in the National Security Council and by the Secretary of State and by, uh, and by the White House. We need more strength on that end of things to channel the country in the direction that minimally can recognize that the principal strategic competition we face today is not military in character, it's economic. You're not going to get that leadership, that insight, that truth out of DOD. So I think that there is a real challenge there, but the principal challenge uh, uh, for DOD is somebody who can direct this, 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 uh, this um, uh, collection of, of uh, feudal kingdoms that each want to go in their own direction, but the, the bigger challenge is to have stronger leadership outside of DOD that will point the country in a different direction. A better look, take a look at the spending of other countries in the world, GDP-wise. Every country seems to recognize and to get the truth that we are now in an era that is defined by an economic strategic competition, that that's where our principal problems lie. The amount of GDP that other countries devote, which I think is indicative of their level of, of uh, uh, effort and the priority they give uh, to, to the military is much lower than ours. We come in around 4.7% of GDP. Uh, the average for uh, other countries is 2%. Among the countries who understand what the nature of the challenge is today, China, leader among them. Uh, they devote less of their GDP to that and probably are happy to see us get ourselves wound up in this new air-sea battle concept, which has us now turning away from land wars in Asia and thinking about, well, if we can't have a land war in Asia, let's have a sea and air war in Asia. Let's invest heavily on, in, in that direction. Now, China is, of course, pouring a lot of money uh, into its military, but relative to what else they're doing with their GDP, they understand that the principal challenge today is economic, and that's going to determine um, who the world leader is in 2050. We don't get it yet, and you're not gonna get that leadership uh, from DOD regardless of who you put in that chair. Okay, we would welcome um, uh, questions or comments from the audience and have some interaction with you. Yes. Yeah, hi, my name is Jean Athey. A uh, question for uh, Mr. Conetta. Um, my understanding was that actually um, um, Obama has not reduced the, the core Pentagon budget 
and w w but I think that your chart implies that he has, and I'm assuming that when you said a 5% reduction, you're including all of the savings from um, hopefully us getting out of Afghanistan. But even when Obama presented his budget, he said um, this is going to be, uh, this is actually an increase in the core Pentagon budget for the next 10 years. Uh, so am, am, am I misunderstanding something, or is, is that correct? A, a, a little bit. Um, um, the reduction I talked about, 5%, is a reduction in real terms. If you actually look at the, the spending in current dollars, you don't make any correction for inflation, from uh, 2009, 2010, 2000, it's been pretty much flat in terms of current dollars. When you, when you take account of inflation, the base budget, the non-war budget, has only declined by 5%. But the, the war budgets have declined dramatically. So actually, at one point, we had budgets that were in the range of, in today's dollars, $717 billion a year for national defense, including war. And now what we're looking at is something that's much, uh, that is uh, perhaps $100 billion lower than that. Um, so there has been that reduction. It's all been due principally to war, to the reduction in, in war spending. What we're not paying attention to uh, is the base budget spending, the non-war spending, which did grow 40, it grew enormously during the period. Um, and what, what I put up there is a chart that, that actually uh, shows the, the total change in spending since 1997. The blue line represents the total, the red line represents um, represents the, uh, the base budget. Um, so you'll, you'll see that both have grown uh, pretty dramatically. The, the war played a, a huge part. Um, so uh, there, there has been and there will be a reduction in defense spending if you include the war. But then you have to go back and think about 1998, 99, and say that defense spending, including war spending, grew by 100%. Uh, what we have seen over the past 12 years is a rise in spending that combines the Reagan surge with the Vietnam surge with the earlier surge uh, introduced by Kennedy at the beginning of the 60s. We've not seen anything like this in our history short of the Second World War. And it's that that they are refusing to back off from. Yes. Um, Carl Kennedy made the point that the biggest problem with sequestration is less so the absolute number than the rate at which it would be applied. Uh, but if you look at it visually or mathematically, you compare that with the post-Korean War cut, it looked even bigger on a percentage basis in the Korean War. What were the consequences of that if, when that happened? Sure, you mean the, the uh, we go back to the other yeah, slide. Right. Yeah, right. At the very beginning is what we're talking about. That was a very, the, right. the consequences were very bad. The consequences of the drop that happened, and you don't really see um, the period of the war itself. But uh, we went down so far, so fast, from a very high level, um, uh, and releasing people uh, from the military who had been in the military for many years fighting the Second World War, that our capacity to deal with Korea um, was, was undermined. Uh, and so then you see this huge jump upwards. But nobody is really talking about anything like that. Um, I would take a look at that, uh, the, the purple line and the red line at the end. I would say that we can, the DOD should be able to digest sequestration relatively easily. Shouldn't happen all at once. It happened over three or four years. That will still leave the budget well above the orange line as the average for the Cold War period. So we will still have a budget that, that's, uh, that is uh, above that uh, Cold War level. Um, I think you could probably go down lower, though I would, I would uh, wait a few years <laughs> to see what develops in the world, because uh, you know, we, we, can't see, uh, we can't see that far into the future. So yes, nothing like what happened uh, after the Second World War, um, I think, is, is, is really in the cards at all, and, and not even by sequestration. If I could just add a little bit, uh, Carl's correct about all that. The, the other heartburn about sequestration is that it would automatically cut every project program and activity across the board other than exempted personnel accounts. Um, that's what the law says. That's not what they would probably do if they actually had to do it. Um, um, in OMB and DOD, they're perfectly aware of what all the gimmicks are to get around that sort of fine grain across the board cutting exercise. Um, the other point I think is more important, though, that, that whatever 
happens in this budget deal, and the only people who the people who know what's where these budget negotiations are headed aren't talking, and the people who are talking don't know what's going on. So I, you know, I, I read the newspapers these days with a lot of a lot of salt. Uh, but somehow the Pentagon budget is going to be affected. It's going to be over um, the longer term, and it's coming down. And it's not going to be the mechanism um, triggered by sequestration. Even if January 2nd happens, and technically it starts, there's going to be at some point a budget deal that subs subsumes all that. But it's all coming down, and they'll be lucky if it levels off at the sequestration level on that graph. Well, when, if I could uh, pursue that a moment, I think what you're saying is that by a budget deal, you mean the, the Pentagon leaders will come to Congress and suggest some way of... Um, well, they'll, they'll, they'll do what they're told um, if we have a president. Um, the president will negotiate a budget deal. It will include um, a, a spending line for 050 for national defense. The Secretary of Defense will be consulted about that. But the pieces that go into this puzzle, in taxes and entitlements and non-defense discretionary, are such that the Pentagon doesn't drive this negotiation. Um, the President does. And he will instruct the Secretary of Defense as to what the deal is. And the Secretary of Defense will instruct the Joint Chiefs. And if they want to resign, more power to them. Um, um, but they will, they will come and present a budget after the budget deal is done where they basically do what they are told. Yes. Uh, Charles Him, Mr. Man. I have uh, three questions. First is uh, President Obama said that is there no war, then can have, we can have a national building. And Chairman Coleman, you mentioned that too. I would I'd like to know that how could you save the money you don't have? So my question, where does the money come from for the national building? And second is, is there's always mention about the waste and inefficiency in uh, defense spending. Uh, anybody know how much that in terms of the uh, defense spending? And uh, should we talk about that and to deal with it? And the third question is general from the Heather uh, speaking. The world is changing. I, I think we should have thinking and uh, have a new defense strategy. Once you have a strategy, then you, would, you, you will know what kind of leadership you, you can have and also what kind of armed forces you have and also the defense technology you have. So, should we have discussion about this uh, uh, defense strategy? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had a couple of thoughts. Um, you say, how do we invest in domestic uh, affairs, money we don't have? But depending on the nature of the deal, if you raise revenues, uh, basically you're saying money you're not spending on the Pentagon may be available for other purposes of public investment. It really depends on the larger parameters of the budget deal. Um, as for waste in the Pentagon, um, I'm interested whether my colleagues could put a percentage on it. I think it's, uh, it's deep and it's pervasive, and I, I think it depends how you define it. I mean, if you're buying a weapon you don't need, is that wasteful? I would say yes. Uh, there's certainly smaller kinds of waste in terms of procurement policy and overruns and so forth, um, but that has, has got to be a key target. Uh, I think we could do a whole panel on an alternative strategy, but it's, it's clear that spending on nuclear weapons uh, preparing for large-scale counterinsurgency, uh, the kind of uh, maybe overly optimistic sense of what we can do uh, with drones and naval power. Uh, I think all those need to be reconsidered, but you know, that's, we could have a whole conference on that. So um, one very specific way of, of thinking about waste that I really like is that during uh, this period of, of growth, that um, Carl's slide shows, um, there was also astronomical growth in expenses on contracting. And um, the Project on Government Oversight and Taxpayers for Common Sense have estimated that you could 
impose a, a haircut, I believe it's a 10% haircut on Pentagon contracting, which would make up um, 300 billion of the 500 billion from sequester. And if you imagine that um, there's not 10% of waste in contracting, then um, the panel has a bridge it would like to sell you. So, so one way of thinking about how much waste, inefficiency, unnecessary spending is there is enough to deal with sequester, enough to make the sequester contribution. Um, and on the strategy question, you know, it has been true throughout American history. I think it's Bernard Baruch who said, strategy wears a dollar sign. So in point of fact, we're not ever, we wouldn't want, actually having a strategy conversation completely apart from a conversation about money and national investment is what brought us the, the steep line on, the, on that curve. So in fact, what we want to have is a strategic conversation in which money and where it comes from and where it goes and its relationship to national power is part of the conversation. Um, and I completely agree with you and what Bill said that that's, that's desperately needed. Um, one other point I just want to make in response to that because I think it's, it's something that happened. Um, power followed this money. And so, you know, Winslow and Carl both made points about the Defense Department being different from the State Department. And as a proud alumna of the State Department during the Clinton years, I, I say this with some grief, but yes, the Defense Department is different from the State Department. It's more powerful. Um, and in point of fact, your regional combatant commander these days engages in at least as much diplomacy as his, um, his diplomatic counterpart and has a lot more resources at his disposal. So unfortunately, and I don't think this is a good thing, but one of the challenges we face when trying to reform the Pentagon is trying to move some of its power back to civilian institutions. And that's separate but not wholly unrelated to this, this numbers discussion. Just real quickly on the waste thing. Um, the second fundamental I, for, I, I neglected to mention in my remarks uh, was the basic problem of Pentagon not knowing where the money is going, not knowing what it does when it gets there, and not knowing what's coming out the other end. Um, to understand however you want to define waste, and, and, um, and I'm fine with the broad definition, but however you want to define it, you don't know how much there is until you've succeeded an audit. Um, that is going to be sometime after the 2017 deadline the Pentagon has set, it up, set up for itself. In 2014, they say we're going to have a statement of budgetary resources which tells us where the money went. In 2017, they say they're going to have an audit of the assets, which is the stuff. Uh, but nowhere is in the plan is what happened with the money when it got to the recipient. Um, and that's the key part, of course, and that's the part that they somehow forgot to put in their plan. And so knowing how much um, um, technically uh, definable waste, fraud, and abuse has occurred is nowhere is on the Pentagon depending on horizon. Yeah, go ahead, Carl. Uh, yeah, on the, on the waste question, I've got, to, I've got to agree with Winslow. You know, Don Rumsfeld, uh, he, he said there's got to be 5% waste. There's got to be. Um, though he didn't identify it, nor did he get rid of it. Um, and back in the 1990s, when the curve was coming down, there was a great deal of interest uh, in, in defense reform. Um, and I believe it was the, the National Commission on 21st Century Strategy, which was the red team to the, to the official strategy thinkers inside the Pentagon. They identified something like 15%. What we actually accomplished that is identifiable had to do with, uh, had to do with base reductions, and that turned out to be 3%. Most of that evaporated as soon as we talked about re, uh, uh, reorganizing our, uh, our global posture. So now you take a look at the, the military construction account, it's gone through the roof. Um, but I think the key thing here is that there's no incentive in the Pentagon to economize. And until you produce that incentive, you're not going to be able to identify waste. It is as though um, uh, there was an open account that you could just go in and get money and spend it. There's no political downside to spending money on defense, uh, or at least there hasn't been until today because I think there's more, there's a greater recognition that it's DOD versus everything else. 
um, that, that if, you, if you want to find that trillion dollars, it's there. So there's, there's more sensitivity to it today. But prior to today, there was no incentive. Um, I think on the, on, the strategy, uh, on the strategy question, yes, we need a strategy that, we need to not think of strategy as just being defense strategy. There's defense strategy, there's national security strategy, which should bring in the State Department and, and other elements of, uh, of government, treasury, commerce, they all have a role to play. And then there's national strategy. The most important thing to do is to understand what we're doing as a nation when we face challenges abroad and challenges at home. Uh, of various sorts, and that will inform the other, the other, uh, the other levels of strategy. But let's. We have time for one more quick question and quick answer. Go ahead. Yeah, on um, on the point of national strategy, is there anybody you'd point to as the key thinker or key organization? And specifically on a separate issue, what about non-defense spending in the defense budget? There's many worthy, worthy programs that got there because it was politically possible. What should be done with them? So can I, I'll start with that last piece, um, that um, there was an effort early in um, the first Obama term to move some, some programs out of the Pentagon and back to state. And it was, um, Gates and Clinton negotiated it, it was all set up and wired, and it went to Congress, and Congress said, oh state, you're getting this money from the Pentagon, that's money you don't need, and they X'd an equivalent part out of somewhere else in the State Department budget. And Gates said, well, we're never doing that again because I need those programs to get done. I was happy for you, Hillary, to do them, but if Congress isn't gonna let you, it's gonna, then we're not doing it again. And that effectively, you know, there had been a good faith effort to think about doing that and it just stopped. Um, which heightens, I think, a bigger issue that all of this raises is that um, your, le your national leadership has to be willing to think about institutional reform at a time that it's also thinking about national security challenges and it's trying to think about you know, getting the economic car back out of the ditch and up to speed on the highway. And any administration of any political stripe, if you're a cabinet secretary, you have four years to get something done, um, are you really gonna make it a priority to root out waste, to try to change contracting practices when, you know, as Bill, Bill's book documents so well, you know, the guys you're up against have been doing this for their whole careers and know how to beat you at it, or are you gonna focus on, um, you know, trying to get a nuclear deal with Iran or trying to improve the Afghan army or something else like that as your legacy? So um, that's a long way of saying why um, there were good intentions around that, it came to naught, and I'm fairly pessimistic about it at, at this point given the intense, and everything we've said about the Pentagon, the budgetary pressures on state are much more intense, and. Nobody complains about how many jobs it'll cost, or by the way, how many ambassadors it kills when you cut embassy security. Uh, oh, okay, um, well. Oh, are we done? Well, go ahead if you have one. Sure. Uh, there's one overlap that shouldn't be happening, which is that the Pentagon is running its own military assistance program. The State Department should be overseeing that stuff because there's no human rights uh, qualifications or not to the standards that state would have. There's no transparency. Uh, it, it runs outside of the grain of our foreign policy it's almost sort of a runaway train. It's, I think those military assistance programs need to be either ha have much, much, much more scrutiny or ideally be uh, overseen by the State Department as part of a broader foreign policy. Well, I think we've had a good discussion of um, why the military sequester might be welcome in some quarters and for, for good reasons. And I want to thank the audience for paying such close attention and the panelists for their presentations and discussions. Let's give them all a round of applause and yourselves.